since this is a class on literature, the obvious question is, what is, what is literature? What is literature? That may sound like an obvious, like it has an obvious answer, but is anything written literature? Or is there some sort of criteria for what we study in this class and what we commonly refer to as literature? This is an important question and it's a fundamental question because we're studying literature. And so is anything that was written in the past worthy of our attention? Is it worthy of our analysis? Is it worthy of our consideration? So we're gonna first briefly cover what is literature? And then we're gonna talk about how do we interpret literature, something called literary analysis. This is our criteria for literature. It is texts, and this can also be speeches. It can be documents, uh, memoirs, uh, a, a range of texts. We obviously think of books when we think of literature, but this has a, a wide application. Roughly anything that is ultimately written down. Okay, so what is our criteria for literature? Texts that represent a common experience. Usually literature speaks to the human experience. For instance, one of the first genres that we will cover in this class are slave narratives. And so those covered a the experiences of millions of African Americans, but anyone can read it really throughout all of all ages and identify with being oppressed, being controlled, have someone else determining your life and your agenda, a longing for freedom, a longing for expression, abuse. Humanity can identify with the experience uh, in, in slave narratives. And so literature represents in its best form, humanity. What do we go through? And this is also true of other genres such as music. You know, there's a, there's a song that a billion people view on YouTube. They view the, they view the video. Why? Because they identify, they identify with it. Well, how could a billion different people identify with something? Because it's, it's, it's common to the human experience. It's common to the human experience. This also is the case with artwork, great artwork. Throughout thousands of years, hundreds of years, people identify with it, even though they come from all different backgrounds. Why? Because it represents the, a common experience. Literature, especially for our class, is an articulation of hushed voices. So it's, it represents the human experience, but it also represents those who often cannot speak for themselves or cannot be heard, that's better, cannot be, are not heard. So we know with enslaved Blacks in many states, it was law that they could not learn how to read or write. That was the law. And so it is of a, a premium. It is extremely valuable when you have literature that shares, covers the experiences of those who are not usually heard and those who are in fact silenced. It can also be representative of a literary period. We would discuss the major literary periods in American literature, in this class, uh, things don't always comport with and fit neatly in a, in a literary genre, like some of the African-American literature we'll cover isn't necessarily uh, romantic literature. Uh, some try to force it to fit, but good literature does represent at least what is happening 
during that time. Okay, we may call it the zeitgeist uh, of the time. So it's it's representative of what's happening during a time and may reflect the literary period. Although we need to watch out for that because oftentimes that is a white supremacist, white imposed way of looking at it. So you need to represent this sort of literary period and this is what's going on. And it's not factoring in the hushed voices and, and literature from other peoples. It's an astute reflection or critique of the time. And so in some ways it may reflect the time, but then again, it also critiques the time. We think of Frederick Douglass's narrative in which he has a sharp and trenchant critique of the enslavement of Black people and American so-called Christianity. So he's not only talking about his experience as an enslaved uh, Black person, but he is also uh, critiquing slavery. And this is the sort of Du Boisian double consciousness and our readings from Ida Wells Barnett. Ida Barnett Wells also has this element of she's depicting lynching in a very realistic but also a pathos filled way and she's critiquing it in the same in the same time that she's in fact her her observation of it her expose of it is also a critique of it okay and this is we'll we'll cover continually in this class this will be a midterm question it will be a final question why study african american literature why study african american literature the question sounds messed up prima facie because it, what, what do you mean why study african american literature um, why not just study literature in general? Well, this is an African-American class. And also there has been, in many ways recently, an assault on African-American literature. And there has been literature bans. And so what was assumed at one time uh, now has to be proven, at least in some quarters. And one of the, I think, central values of African-American literature is that it critiques the white zeitgeist. So uh, a Slavery was legal, okay? Jim Crow was the, the policy, de facto and the official policy. Um, reconstruction, uh, these were entrenched systems and ways of life. And in many ways, the, 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 the white literature did not always critique these. And so the black literature says, hey, there's another point of view and now I'm, I'm gratified to say that in many ways, the Black point of view, if you will, has prevailed. Hopefully, everyone these days condemns American chattel slavery and any sort of slavery. So it's, it's perhaps an, an irony, maybe Christological, that the first have become last. And those who were silenced, that their voices are now preeminent, preeminent. Uh, literature is farsighted. It not only reflects the time, the times in which it is written, but in many ways it's prophetic. And it, it's like it's looking at the time, but it also sees above it and beyond it, and it's able to critique. Now, of course, every piece of literature will not fulfill all of these criteria, uh, but they certainly fulfill uh, several of them or most of them. It's iconic. It's iconic. So the text that we'll be covering, most of the texts we'll be covering in this class are well-known. Okay? The text of the poems of Phyllis Wheatley, the narrative of Alato Echiano, the texts of W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the text of the Harlem Renaissance uh, poets, Zora Neale Hurston. So we're going to be covering iconic texts and it, it behooves you to be familiar with these, to be conversant in them because it's sort of a common 
discourse. Okay, sort of like you always hear about uh, Shakespeare, or maybe you always hear about Edgar Allan Poe or Walt Whitman. And to be educated, you should have some knowledge of these. Well, this is this is the case with the text that we are covering uh, in this class. They're they're iconic, influential in shaping thought. We've already touched on that. Widely acknowledged. So you write a book and it's a classic in your mind. It's a classic in maybe your family, maybe, maybe your parents say, this is a classic. This is a classic son. In my case, this is a classic daughter. Uh, but no one else thinks it's a classic. It's, it's not a classic then. It, 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 there has to be some consensus. It has to be acknowledged as literature, as, as uh, a, a classic, if you will, and then it has to endure. So the very fact that the texts we are covering in this class are acknowledged and are enduring um, by, by virtue of being taught in this class says that it is literature, it is literature. So this is this is the a key question of this class, and in fact, this class is going to answer, it's going to respond to this question: Why study African American literature? So early on, our discussion boards will cover this. Some of my initial initial um, responses are these. Okay, so it represents common experiences. It's an eloquent articulation of hushed voices. So we learn about our black forebears, okay, about our ancestors through the literature. It represents what was happening at the time. How else will we know of what was happening at the time? But through these voices back then, um, what, when was, when was uh, really recordings first developed? audio recordings, maybe the late 1890s, maybe early 1900s. And so we can look at uh, images, we can look at painting, we can look at photography and others, but really we learn about the past through the text in many ways, okay? And we know in some cultures there is a, a system of, of uh, verbal uh, transmission, but in, in this case here, we're looking at literary works, okay? They are critiques of the time. Oftentimes, Black literature is one of the few uh, voices, if you will, in America that are articulating what's happening. Uh, like we look at uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl okay, by Linda Brent um, Harry Jacobs. She was the first to so clearly, explicitly, really just the first to, to be a major voice on what was happening to enslaved Black women, enslaved Black women. So where else will we get this from, okay? And besides that, it's, it's, it's very well written, okay? Um, influential in shaping thought, enduring. So these are some of the reasons, but you can even get personal, okay? It, it gives you purpose. It tells what people who look like you uh, went through. And in this case, it's, it's, it's in the United States of America, but of course it's, as we said, we, it's, it's about humanity. Okay, it's about humanity. So these are, these are some of the things, uh, there's common literacy. Like we said, these are now the sort of literary lingua franca and so you need to know what my bondage and my freedom says to be basically literate, to have basic uh, discussions, all right? Uh, you need to know the, the poetry of Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, as just a basic, basic literacy, all right? And so, you're thinking about why should we study African-American literature? Someone said, I'm just studying it to get, to get an A, to pass the class. That too, that too. But we want to go deeper than that. 
So you need to uh, grapple with this question uh, throughout the semester, but definitely have an answer by midterm. So what is literary analysis? So we know what literature is. Now that we know what literature is and that it's so important, it's, it's, so, it's so key. Um, by the way, I, I, I do want to touch on one more thing of why study African-American literature, and it even ties into criteria for literature, and that is your own raison d'etre, your own reason for existence. I believe that in literature, you can find out why you are here. What is your meaning? What is your purpose in life? Literature is, 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 is very adept at, at helping you with that, telling you that, okay? All right, so now that you know what literature is, it is worth studying it. It is worth studying it, All right? So how do you study literature? So Literary analysis is, 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 is it's a simple, these are simple, you know, root terms. Liter, literary means something that's written down or a book. And analysis means to look at, okay, usually for an extended period of time with some scrutiny. And some of the synonyms for literary analysis or studying, looking at texts are literary criticism, textual analysis, content analysis, exegesis, parsing, and hermeneutics. Okay, now these are these are approximate synonyms. Uh, so some of them have different, different senses to them, like hermeneutics is more interpreting a text. But that's also a part of the literary analysis. Exegesis is, is what you pull from the text as opposed to something like eisegesis, which is a lot like deconstruction in which you're putting your own stuff into the text. We'll talk about that. Uh, but these are rough synonyms of literary analysis. Okay, how do we do literary analysis? How do we analyze a text? Whenever you are endeavoring upon a text, you're starting to read a text, you're going to read a text, you're going to analyze a text. These are some basics of, of what, you, what you will look at before, during, and after uh, your your study of the text. First, who wrote it? Now, this is almost always available to us, I would say. There is some anonymous literature. Uh, this is really becoming a fraught endeavor in the age of social media and YouTube. When you see a comment on YouTube and it uh, under a video and it intrigues you, and it, it intrigues you so much that you want to know what does it mean? So you want to do a little miniary many analysis of the comment on YouTube, but you don't know who the, who the author of it is. You go to their account and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a play name or it's an ironic name or there's no name, there's BB2023. So you don't know the author, but I would say 95 or more percent of the time for literature, we know who the author is. Maybe not always much about the author, but we know who the author is. So first of all, do a uh, brief, and you can use your discretion as to how deep you should go for this, but um, do a biographical study of the author. Okay, who was the author? Who was the author? And you can figure out uh, life dates, age when they wrote it, uh, what did they do with their life? What was their profession? What was their status? Um, in this class, is important as to their race um, and their and their gender and their region, the region where they wrote it, or the region in which they they came from. So all of this becomes important. Okay? Sometimes education. You can go on down the list of things you need to find out about the author. When was it written? This is the date, but also what was going on during the time. Okay, and what was this own, what was this own person's context? This is called exigence. Why did they write it? Why did they write it? What's their reason for writing it? Okay, what's the style? 
How is it written? What's the genre? We're going to talk about that. That's just the category of, of writing. So what we cover in this class is, like we said, slave narrative, uh, speeches, memoir, journal, diary, poetry, biography, autobiography, history, sociology, reportage or journalism, novel. So these are some of the genres we cover. Who's the audience? Who, who do you think? Let's say the primary audience, because obviously you're the audience now. So someone who's writing in 1830 wasn't thinking that they were going to be writing to Howard University students in 2023. So who do you think was their primary audience? Uh, what's the summary? Summarize the book. Summarize the piece, the article. Summarize it. What are the major themes? How was the work received in its time? And what was its impact? So these are some of the basics that we ask for literary analysis. Uh, author, date, audience, context, genre, content, form, language, voice, intent, reception. We can get deeper and deeper into this. And then once we do these basics, if you want a, we, we won't be doing much of this in this class, much of these, but you can do deeper, deeper studies. Okay. And all of these right here are ways of looking at a text ways of looking at a text that all uh, all make sense. Like I said, some of these have, have come under fire these days, like a lot of times a psychoanalytic way of looking at a text, uh, let's say a Freudian way of looking at a text, that's been liquidated. Um, that's, that's considered by some to be inappropriate or improper. Okay, you don't, you shouldn't do a, a psychological analysis of Sojourner Truth because, you know, she's not on the, you know, she's not a proverbial psychiatric, you know, client. You're not psychoanalyzing her. You don't know what she was thinking. Um, the mindset was different. Uh, what have you. Okay, so the psychoanalytic kind of Freudian style in many ways, that is uh, not not acceptable anymore. But of course, when you're reading a text, you want to know the psychology of the person. What is the person thinking? Um, have past traumas or past situations affected them? Okay. Um, ethnic studies. Uh, we, we have Afrocentric forms of interpretation. And this is something that we do unapologetically at Howard. And that's asking if it's, well, we'll get into uh, our example here of the Declaration of Independence. What did this text mean to Black people at the time? Tell me that's not valid. <laughs> what did it mean to Black people? They say, oh, well, you know, the Afrocentric form of, of um, textual analysis is not valid. How? If an African read that in, in 1776, 1780, 1785, 1790, what would they think? That's perfectly legitimate to ask. What would a woman think? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all what? All men are created equal. And so did women think that they were included? So all of these in their own way have a legitimate way of looking at a text. All right? Okay, so as I said, our example, this is in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we go on down our list. Who are the authors in this case? When was it written? Who was their audience? And all of this, these have very distinct answers. Okay. So who was the Declaration of Independence written to? I won't, I won't spill the beans, but it's, it's a very distinct audience. But then there's a huge, perhaps global, secondary audience for the Declaration of Independence. What was the context? What was happening where is when it's written? And this is, this is 
everything. If you don't know the context of the Declaration of Independence, then you won't know anything about it. What was the exigence? What was going on when it was written? Why was it written? What's the content? What's the form? What kind of document is it? Would it make sense if you thought that it was a novel or if you thought it was poetry? Would that make sense? Okay, what language is used? Why is the language used? Okay, what's the voice? What's the intent? What did the authors of the Declaration of Independence want to accomplish? This is very distinct. They, had, they were writing it to a distinct audience. They wanted to accomplish a very um, distinct outcome. And how was it received? <laughs> I, I think we know what happened. There was, there was war, right? There was war. There was war. And then we can go on to other concerns. What is an economic analysis of this? Who wrote it? And, you know, we, we know some of these things right off the top of our heads. All of them were white men. Okay. All of them were white men. All of them were white men, maybe over 35. Maybe the average age was 55. Okay. They were all, most of them, at least, I, I don't want to be too sweeping, but most of them were landowners. Okay, most of them, um, I think research may show that almost all of them were slave owners or they had owned slaves. So what is this saying? How does this factor into our analysis of this? Okay, is there a theological analysis? Why does it say creator? What is meant by creator? Okay, is that is that God? There's been a lot of there's been myriad works, myriad volumes written as to if the quote unquote founding fathers were Christians. Did they believe in God? Did they believe in God like we may think of God? Environmental analysis. Okay, this this uh, kind of analysis has risen to the fore. Uh, what does it mean to be created um, and created equal? What is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And is is everyone does everyone get that equally when we are depleting the Earth's resources? Okay, classicist analysis. Um, what does this say about owning land or owning people or who, who wrote it? What was their class? Who were they writing it to? What was their class? So there's all these different analysis, gender analysis. I just mentioned that, um, that this was probably literally written for men, uh, that men do what they want. This is a man's world and they can pursue life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It didn't apply to women. It didn't apply to women. Okay, so these are some types of literary analysis that we can do of this, but then because the Declaration of Independence is good literature, um, it, it, it can apply to everybody. So later we see all sorts of Black authors, perhaps most famously Martin Luther King Jr., who took the Declaration of Independence and he applied it and says, listen, this is what you said. You said all men are created. <laughs> and so Good literature is versatile like that. You can take it and apply it to different situations. And so Martin Luther King was saying, this is a check that America has not cashed. It's, it's what it's, it's defaulted in the bank of, of justice. Okay, so it's far sighted, it's iconic, it's enduring, it's been influential. There's been studies that have shown that um, what, 60, 70, 80, 90 countries based their own Declaration of Independence and their own charter their own freedom charters on the Declaration of the American Declaration of Independence. And so even though that is very limited and not far-sighted, it has become uh, enduring and it's definitely literature. Okay, so this is some, uh, this is for you to think about as you are looking at literature and doing your own literary analysis um, in this class. I want you to be thinking actively in this class. Why are we studying literature? What is the 
import of it? How did it apply in its time? How did it shape its time? How does it speak to me now? How does it tell me about my own uh, purpose in life? And then think about and produce uh, your own literature.